All right. It says that it's hit, hit record. And so um, I would like to welcome everyone who has joined us here. My name is TH Tran. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm a senator in the School of Public Health Senate. So before we begin this structural oppression seminar, we need to acknowledge that due to current events this week, people may be experiencing different feelings in response. Some people may be feeling anger or grief or numbness or many other things. We wanna give you space and support and honor whatever you may be feeling or experiencing. Please take care of yourself today in whatever way feels good to you. I'm going to have some resources posted in the chat and um, please add any additional resources that you trust and would like to share with the group. We cannot solve violence without confronting systems of structural oppression. So I'm really grateful that we're having this seminar today and I'm really grateful to all of you for being in community with us today. The School of Public Health community pr prioritizes health equity. So the School of Public Health Senate is making it our priority too. In partnership with the School of Public Health's diversity, equity and inclusion team, we are hosting the Structural Oppression Seminar series this spring to shine a light on systems of structural oppression that impact the work of public health. For accessibility, we will have live captions available and this recording will be made available to all that have registered registrants other, afterwards. If there is anything else I or the team can do to make this series more inclusive of your individual needs, please let Kelia Silvis know via DM now or via email later. And Kelia has put her email into the chat at this point. Before we begin, I'm gonna make a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is a land grant institution located on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. The University of Minnesota and the School of Public Health owe an ongoing debt to the Dakota people and have a duty to create healthy dialogue, relationships and practices that readdress this injustice as well as, other related, as well as others related to the indigenous peoples of this state. With this grounding, I'm really delighted to introduce James Burroughs. James is the first ever Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer of Children's Minnesota. Children's offers a breadth of services to get the healthcare that children need. And as a CEIO, James helps make health, makes, make health and well being accessible for all children. James has more than 25 years of experience in the areas of nonprofit management, equity, diversity, inclusion, and employment law. We are so, so excited to have James here to share his insight and expertise with us. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Well, thank you so much, CH, I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, that's the first step towards a good Friday. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I know there's a lot going on with uh, spring break, uh, a lot going on with Good Friday for those who celebrate Easter. Easter. Uh, a lot going on with me. I'm getting on the plane in two hours, so uh, I'm fitting this in within that framework as well. Um, and I, I appreciate you acknowledging too the week that it's been for uh, people in community, uh, especially uh, in Minnesota, but especially uh, people of color and Native Americans. Um, the trial started with George Floyd uh, officially in my mind this week with opening statements. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, um, outpour, unfortunately, of crimes against uh, people of Asian descent. We still have too many children locked up, and uh, I call them concentration camps, but they're immigration camps with kids not getting the, the services that they need. Uh, and we got to do better. We have to do better for all of our families and children. Uh, today, I want to just take a little time uh, of talking about a few things. Uh, I managed to do my own PowerPoint, and I'm going to share my own screen. If it works, give me a high five. If it doesn't, I don't do this regularly, so we're going to have to flow with it and, and figure out what we do there. But uh, I want to give you some information about you know, what I do and then also to how this uh, situation we're in right now is impacting children. So without further ado, I want to share my screen. So I'm going to see if I can do that and then see if everyone can see it. Thumbs up. All righty. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> real quick, um, also again, my name is James Burroughs, I'm the Vice President and Chief Equity Inclusion Officer at Children's of Minnesota. Uh, in a previous life before coming to Children's, I was the Chief uh, Equity and Inclusion Officer for the state of Minnesota, uh, working for Governor Mark Dayton um, in the Dayton administration as well. So I've been doing this work, uh, even before that, I was at Minneapolis Public Schools doing similar work. I've been doing this work for quite a while, but just new to the healthcare industry um, as it relates to that. Uh, also, in a former life, I was a practicing lawyer for a while. I did uh, white collar crime, defense, healthcare, law, and some other things uh, as well. So, 
Thank you for having me here. And I used to teach at the U, University of Minnesota Law School back in the uh, 90s before some of you were probably born, but uh, I was a teacher, a faculty uh, person at the U Law School as well. So let's see, I'm gonna click my first slide. And eventually it's gonna move. There we go. Um, I'm going to talk a little about my life, who I am, uh, a little bit more in detail. And I want you to, as you listen to me today, think through the lens of what I tell you about my childhood and how impact of racism, systemic racism, and structural racism could have affected it. Um, I'm not going to give you a lot of uh, medical data or medical uh, history, a little bit at the end about what system of racism does to the physical body of a child. I want you to listen carefully about what I tell you about me and think about your childhood as well, how some of these things may have affected you as well. I'm gonna talk a little bit about equity and structural racism, uh, also about children's values and the systemic racism at Children's Minnesota. When I first got this uh, request, I was going to go out into the world and find things about different systems that uh, exhibit systemic racism. But I figured we start at home where I work. Uh, we have systemic racism at Children's Minnesota, as is other healthcare systems. I want to talk about what some of that could look like and to talk about what we're doing around it as well. My life. Uh, I was born in 1967. Uh, and these pictures here are from July of 1967. I was born in October. And I want to have you imagine this with me. My mom, uh, pregnant with me in July of 1967 had to endure um, at least three to 4,000 National Guardsmen in the city of Detroit who were there because of riots within the city. Uh, those riots took place because uh, at one of the after hour party spots, uh, police brutally murdered quite a few folks uh, of African-American descent. And those folks fought back and were upset about that. And it turned into the 1967 Detroit riots. Uh, there's a movie called Detroit that if you can stomach it, watch it because it tells a very vivid story of a very violent time. So imagine my mom pregnant with me during this time of rioting, during this time of violence, during this time of occupation. Uh, you don't have to remember too far back until last year that some of this looks familiar with what happened after the George Floyd murder uh, as well. Uh, that influ influenced and impacted me in a variety of ways, but it also impacted, I'm sure, my health as a child as it relates to uh, my mom being pregnant at this time. I also went to Morehouse College. It's a small little school in um, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, here's a couple of our graduates here. The one on the left is Martin Luther King. The two hugging and embracing on the right are Samuel L. Jackson and also Spike Lee. Um, I'm not as famous as any of them, but I always like to show famous people from my school. Uh, the thing I want to talk about Morehouse real quick is when I was there my freshman year, uh, we were on Oprah and we weren't on Oprah for a great reason. We were on Oprah because a city council person named Hosea Williams from Atlanta uh, was protesting about civil rights in a county called Forsyth County, Georgia. And while he was protesting there, uh, there were rocks thrown at him. There were Confederate flags uh, hailed at that time. There were lots of Klansmen who uh, identify themselves as Klansmen violently um, uh, throwing things at him. And that was in 1985. So it wasn't like long ago, it wasn't in the 60s, it was 1985 and I was a young 18 year old kid. Uh, after that um, got back to the cities, we all went down from what's called the Atlanta University Center. And we went down and protested about thousands of us, tens of thousands of us uh, in that small town of Forsyth County. Oprah did an episode there and talked to some of the people and they literally did not want people who were black in their town because they thought uh, we would do something bad to their city. Um, I say that to you again, once again, I'm an adolescent. I'm also uh, at Morehouse College, but I'm also experiencing uh, systemic and also physical racism as well. From there, I went on to go to Georgetown Law School. I'm a Hoya lawyer, what we call ourselves. Uh, and at this time in Georgetown, I'm thinking, okay, we're great. All the racism in the world has ended. I'm going to get to go to law school and do great things. But uh, Tim McVeigh, Tim McVeigh was a law student at Georgetown and Tim decided it was a good idea to break into student records. And when he broke into student records, he would identify um, through the records all the black law students. And he did a comparative analysis in his mind against the white students. And he wrote an article with 
confidential data violating all types of laws as a law student, saying that black students didn't deserve to be at Georgetown, that we all had low test scores and that we didn't deserve to be in the same classrooms as his white colleagues. It's ironic too, because only about a few months ago, a professor at Georgetown was having a, what they thought was an offline conversation on Zoom about how black students uh, are not doing well. And she's surprised that they're uh, at Georgetown as well. That professor was fired. Uh, Tim was expelled. But once again, uh, systemic racism and those remnants of folks wanting to say, you know, they're better because of their certain race reared its head in my, my academic education. And I say this to you not to, to say that there weren't great things that happened in my childhood and my academic education other places, but there are things like this that happen and continue to occur in our systems. Uh, this picture I love to death. It's my daughter when she was two. She's not two anymore. She's eight, so she's a lot longer uh, than this, and those cheeks aren't as fat. But uh, this is Teresa. Um, at the time, we were um, advocates for, we're still advocates for giving blood, but at the time, we worked with uh, Memorial Blood Center. And the blood center uh, helped us get people interested in giving blood for sickle cell patients like Teresa. Uh, sickle cell patients sometimes need blood transfusions and they have the need of blood from people who are of the same antigen makeup. And some of that based upon your race and ethnicity can be a better match. Uh, the reason I bring this up too as well, just like anyone else, um, Teresa wants to be healthy. Just like anyone else, Teresa wants to be mentally in a great space. Well, when Teresa was four, uh, her dad worked for Governor Dayton, as I told you about. And on July 6th of 2016, two months into my job, uh, Philando Castile was murdered. And uh, that took about 12 to 14 hours of my day every day that we were addressing the community, policing, and see what we can do differently around uh, that happening. Uh, at the time, at four years old, my daughter would tell me on a regular basis, Daddy, I'm afraid when I see police, I think they're going to hurt you because she had seen Philando Castile interaction with officers as well. So once again, systemic racism, bias, uh, whatever you want to call it, rears its head in my life and in my child's life at the early age of four. The reason I want to give you that background is when we talk about children being impacted by racism, sometimes we think that it's this thing that's outside of the realm of who we are and what we are and what we're doing, but no, it happens to us every day. And that every day uh, leads to uh, consequences we'll talk about later as well, as far as the impact of racism. Real quick, as far as my life, this is my life on a daily basis. Uh, my job at Children's involves bringing equity, access, solutions, and inclusion and diversity to our hospital system. We have about 5,500 employees. My goal is uh, threefold. One is to meet a more diverse workforce, to bring a more diverse workforce to our hospital system. That means doctors, nurses, CSAs, and also administrative folks uh, as well, all of our employees. My second job is to bring more community partnerships and employ more people uh, through their own businesses that we do contracting with uh, at Children's. We sit in the heart of um, various neighborhoods. One neighborhood we sit in is the Phillips neighborhood where we, 12 blocks from us, where George Floyd was murdered. So uh, one of the things we're committed to is partnering more with the community in that neighborhood and also investing in businesses. And then the third part of my job is to end all health disparities in Minnesota, especially as they relate to kids and pediatrics. Uh, I won't bore you with the whole circle of my um, strategic plan over here, but I will say this, we make sure that we measure the quality of the um, uh, medical um, <clears throat> care that we provide to our patients and families. We identify those when we have disparities, we make sure we're trying to reduce those. And also too, we measure the performance of our hiring and our retention and also our supplier diversity. So one of the things I want you to be clear on as you talk about health equity, a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people say that's a great thing to do, but unless you're measuring it, putting metrics to it, and then when you're not hitting those, identifying solutions, it's really not that important to you. But this is what we do on a daily basis. Real quick, I'm gonna uh, talk briefly about uh, systemic racism. And this is the key part. I got a video and we're gonna see if it works. Okay, share sound. And I think I'm at the end of the video, so bear with me. I gotta to go to front here.
what happens next. Ask yourself why. These are the black stories we've been shown. A narrow view that limits our understanding. But there's so much more to see. The full picture of black life. Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. All right. I managed to play it. I got to manage to keep going and get out of it. Tonight, I'll be eating a calzone from Dobal's in Aurora. Rock on. Tonight, I'll be eating lobster thermidor au gratin. Really? Yeah, but monkeys might fly out of my butt. Make it two calzones. Thanks everyone for your patience with our technical issues. It's 2020 plus. We Ooh. all at this point understand Zoom I, snafus. Oh, I got out of it and um, nothing played that was too uh, crazy that got me fired from my job. That's an amazing right there. All right, so we're gonna go back in to the PowerPoint here. I apologize for that folks. Uh, I do wanna do this though. Those of you, it's a small group today, so I wouldn't normally do this, but I want you to come off mute if you can and tell me what you saw in that video. Anybody? I saw a white business owner suspicious of black teenagers when they were just like getting snacks. Okay. Thank you. What else did we all see? I, I've seen a few of these PG, you know, PNG videos. I think they they do a nice job of speaking to the heart of the the issue that uh, African Americans and Black people are facing. And I just I just love the, you know, speaking to the full picture of, of Black life. So that was my takeaway. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Anybody else? Going again, but I saw some cute families and some adorable fathers. Let me ask this, to that point, when the world sees black men, and I know this is an unfair question, but it's an unfair Friday, so I'm gonna ask it. <laughs> um, when the world sees black men, do they see that, what you just saw? That cute, that father dancing with his daughter, having a good time, coming to a family outing, do they see that? Not on TV, no. Not on TV. Say more. I think that was like, Linda. Oh, I, I just meant in real life. If you put your, if you, you can see that in real life, and you can see that the dynamic is actually very different than that in real life. Where, um, my experience is, black people will cut you a lot of you slack, a lot of for, slack your for your mistakes, and it doesn't work the other way around. Where people are very suspicious. What's going on? Um, young people plus black plus male what's going on and and will keep their distance so they don't have a chance to know don't have a chance to see a different picture okay okay one of the things i want to to basically 
help people to understand, especially during this week, which I said has been rough for me before. Um, when people see George Floyd, mm-hmm. now they see an image on a the wall. They see uh, a man with a knee on his neck. They see uh, a person who, in my opinion, was murdered. Um, but they don't see the dad. They don't see the dad that he was. They don't see the father that he was. They don't see the human that he was. And when we talk about children and we talk about the impact of racism, uh, when you don't see that humanity of a child, that child then uh, is not valued, respected, and they start to play out in their own mind, well, if you're going to treat me like this, this is how I'm going to act towards you. So I really wanted to show that video. This PNG does a lot of those good videos, but this one stuck with me because during this time, we always make assumptions and biases, but the reality is we are going to have those biases and we call them implicit biases, but some of them are going to be actions and they can lead to detrimental consequences. And we're in a time now that those detrimental consequences are really negatively impacting our communities as well. So I want to talk a little bit about equity and how we define it. Um, can you all see the picture of the cute people on, on the screen? Cool, with no YouTube in the background, love it. Um, I really wanted to just say this to you. A lot of times we talk about equality uh, or have been. Um, I don't focus on equality at all, I focus on equity. And that those two middle slides are the comparison I wanna make real quick. Equity is giving each person or each group of people what they need to be successful. So if you have been oppressed, uh, you know, uh, and I wanna say TH acknowledged this earlier and your land has been stolen uh, and people are not on your land doing things on your land without uh, just compensation, you can't expect me to say that everything's equal now because it's not, because that land stealing, that economic uh, depression has made it so that most Native Americans now the smallest population in most towns in most cities in Minnesota, and also too have less wealth, uh, and also too have a lot of issues related to opioids, and that wasn't their issue or their problem. Those are things that were put upon them because of that inequity. So in order to be equitable, we can't just say we're gonna start off on a level playing field because it's not level anymore. Same with a lot of other groups as well. Uh, you can't say there are 401 years of oppression to African-Americans uh, since slavery and then say, now we're gonna be equal. So equity is giving each group what they need to be successful. So sometimes that looks uh, differently in a monetary way, differently in a way that you provide services. Ultimately, we wanna to get to the where we are on the, on the extreme of social justice, where there are no barriers, there are no fences. We can all see this metaphorical baseball game here, which is access to opportunities as well. <clears throat> I really want to leave the last slide here with the reality. The reality is, if you look on the way to the left there, there are people that have lots of boxes, lots of opportunities, lots of access because of nothing they did on their own. That's called privilege. That privilege um, <clears throat> also has been the result of a lot of white supremacy uh, policies, practices, procedures, and actions as well. We don't want to talk about that sometimes as a country, but I really want you to focus on, especially in public health, that if you don't start there, you assume that we got to an inequality in a way that had nothing to do with the system itself. Public health uh, is where it is now because public health was started on a racist foundation. Healthcare in general was started on a racist foundation. Healthcare was started on the premise that there was some difference between people because of their skin color, which we know now there is no difference in people with skin color. We are all humans and there is no physiological difference, but that was made to be a part of healthcare because it wanted to make sure that people could distinguish themselves and why it could be better. I really want you to focus on that reality when you talk about health equity, you talk about solutions, you talk about what we can do better as well. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but <clears throat> what we're trying to go to at Children's and other places is racial equity, uh, eliminating those barriers we talked about, uh, education, infrastructure, uh, wealth uh, gaps as well. We wanna make sure that we're striving to, to give everybody what they need to be successful. But the thing I want you to make clear on too is, um, when people protest, I'm gonna use the George Floyd protest as an example, and they say they want things to be different. What they're not saying to you is they want you uh, individually to change it for them without them at the table. So in the past, we've tried to do that in Minnesota, especially I've been here 30 years and a lot of solutions we come up with, whether it be public health, criminal justice reform or economic wellness, we said we're going to do this to you rather than with you. So if you're at the table participating and that's participating in the solution 
and identifying the problem and identify the impact of implementation, that's what racial equity is about. It's not just saying you're gonna do something different uh, without the people involved. Structural racism, we talked a little bit about that already. It shows up in the form of health, wellness, careers, education, infrastructure. It's those unfair practices, policies, and procedures. What we do at Children's is we have an equity lens that I've co-developed with our leaders. So we look at some of our solutions or practices through an equity lens. This year, when we had to lay off some folks and furlough folks because of the uh, COVID crisis, it impacted healthcare in a negative way. We looked at it through an equity lens and we made sure that we weren't touching people from a certain income level, which had a lot of people of color in it as well. We didn't just do across the board cuts. We said, how is it gonna impact those who need an equitable solution as well? So I'd say that's important as you're dealing with structural racism. And health equity is just being fair and healthier opportunities for everyone, removing those obstacles that I've talked about and the removing those social determinants of health, some of which are employment, education, housing, and creating those safe environments as well. Uh, I'll start there, I'll stop there. Uh, this tree, uh, and I wanna say this, this tree does not was not made by James Burroughs. There's an amazing young lady whose name I could not find because I had it before who made it. Uh, and if you all have it, type it in the chat because I'm taking no uh, responsibility for creating this wonderful thing. But I wanted to show it to you because we talk about systemic racism I think that word sometimes is, and I apologize for using this term, but it's the best one I got right now, bastardized, because we say it so much, we forget what it means. Uh, this graph here shows what systemic racism is as it affects Black people in relating to COVID. It talks about mass incarceration, housing discrimination, high poverty. Uh, what are the consequences of those in the leaves? You can see you know, more Black people in urban areas that are concentrated, hard to social distance around that higher poverty rates of folks losing their jobs. A lot of folks who were on the front line, uh, healthcare workers and food service workers who were exposed early on to COVID and the impact that had. Uh, barriers to employment, lack of access to healthcare, quality healthcare. All of those things led to the disproportionality of Blacks and Latinos getting more infected by COVID and also higher death rates. So when you think about systemic racism, I, I strongly suggest you take a look at this, use it, find out who did it. Uh, and then also to think of systems in this way, they have consequences, they have actions, they have outcomes. Uh, and this is what systemic racism impacts in the community as well. I wanna talk a little bit about children's and how we are trying to address systemic racism and white supremacy, but we are still needing to have the support of community in doing that because we're not there yet. These beautiful faces are employees and kids we serve. Um, they have no purpose on this live show other than I like looking at these beautiful kids and the people that we serve and are employed. So, but I wanted you to know who we are and, and, and what we're all about. We're the seventh largest pediatric system in the country and we're the, the largest in Minnesota. Oh, let me go back real quick. So our values, um, we put kids first. That means we do everything for kids. Um, we make sure we're resilient, we're courage and, and delve into their curiosity. We, we listen, really listen to our parents and our families and their stories so we can have compassion for coming up with uh, medical solutions for them. We own our outcomes. We're 200% accountable for providing great service and we make sure that we own everything that we do. We don't shy away from that. We join together, that means we partner with other caregivers and the community uh, to do things together. And our goal is to be remarkable, to innovative, you know, imagining healthcare, reimagining healthcare, and making sure we could do it for all kids. Now, these are our values. These are values that everybody who comes to Children's believes in. Our board members believe in this, and it's why we do our work. What I want you to think about, though, if you're going to be kids first, listen, really listen, own outcomes, join together, and be remarkable. And if you get in the way of that by saying that you're not going to practice equity, I want you to think about as we talk what that could look like. So you can have all these great values, but not executing on them because you're not thinking about that. Before I get to that point of talking about that, I wanna talk about our children's vision as well. Our vision is to be every family's essential partner in raising healthier children. And what that means is making sure that they have access to great healthcare and in innovative ways. How do we practice systemic racism at children's? I'll say that again. How do we practice systemic racism at children's? I want to own that we do on a daily basis have systemic racism. 
We're not intentionally doing systemic racism. We're not intentionally saying we're gonna be racist, but we have systems that have been giving to the outcomes that we have for a long time, and we are willing to address that. I say that to you and I repeated it because I want more companies, more institutions, more schools to own that. And when you own it, the more counties, more government, you then say, okay, we need to solve for it. Not saying that it doesn't exist in this world. So I'm gonna go back real quick to those kids first and listen, really listen to values I talked about. Um, what if when we talk about all kids, you know, kids first, we were saying all kids except the black, Latino, Asian, native and LGBTQ kids. We really don't really want you to put those kids first. And that doesn't show up by saying, hey, James, your daughter, Teresa, is going to come through the door and we're going to turn away because she's black. No, nope, that shows up by saying that sometimes we invest more money in cancer disorders, leukemia, for example, than we do in sickle cell. And sickle cell may have a greater impact on black patients as opposed to white patients as leukemia. It may end up in saying that we don't do a good job in well-controlled asthma and combo vaccines for our black patients and patients of color as we do for our white patients. So kids first needs to mean that all kids are first and that's something we need to address. And that's that systemic racism that kicks in there. Listen, really listen. What if we listen, but we didn't listen with culture, humility, with that equity lens I talked about. Let's say that we had no interpreters. Let's say that we didn't have any interpreters. We want people to really listen, but we're not translating into their language. But let's say we had interpreters, but we don't take into account intercultural competency or intercultural proficiency so we can hear from different communities as well. Uh, a lot of people had a story to tell after the, the marches and the protests in South Minneapolis. Some people told a story that they were afraid to come to our Chicago and 26 hospital because of the neighborhood and the violence there. Some people told the story that they didn't feel safe around the police who were policing the neighborhood. So if you're listening, really listening, you have to make sure that you're addressing the needs of both those communities as well. Real quick, on owning your outcomes, what if we didn't have outcomes that we address the racial disparities? So uh, there are racial disparities in a lot of our uh, systems of children. Some that we're focused on right now is that well-controlled asthma and combo vaccines where we have a large gap between our black population and our white population. We wanna get that measured. But once you get it measured, you have to do equity, equitable solutions. You can't just measure things. Uh, and I'll say this as a side note in my editorial, so don't hold uh, Dr. Mark Gorlick, our CEO responsible for it. It's a James Burroughs opinion. Um, we measure the mess out of stuff in Minnesota. We got enough data to, you know, to, to, <laughs> I think to stretch from Minnesota to Iowa, to Illinois, all over the place. But once you get the data, what are you doing differently to solve for the problem? So that's one of the things I suggest to you, especially as students, we talk a lot about data, healthcare data, uh, my friend Brooke Cunningham, Dr. Cunningham is on this call. She does an amazing job and study she's doing, but she is also talking about actions. What's gonna look differently when we serve patients and families to address racism as well. Um, the last piece here is joining together. When we talk about joining together, we have to have our community partners be a part of this work with us. It can't just be we're telling them what we're going to do. It has to be that they're a partnership as well. Some of that we're doing at Children's, we're partnering with the African-American Leadership Forum and we partner around COVID to address COVID in the black community. We have a, a two week um, town hall that we do every two weeks on Facebook where we talk about COVID-19, the impact on the black community and how we can solve for that. One of our nurses volunteers her time to do that. And we also talk about public safety and other things as well. We do similar things with the Latino and native community uh, as well. And those are things that are important. Um, when the Asian community was feeling the impact of some people who were less knowledgeable about medicine calling the um, COVID outbreak, the China flu or the, uh, uh, the Kung flu or the virus related to Asian folks, which led to a lot of the violence they're experiencing now. Uh, we made sure that we had our ERGs and our patients and families in our community. We partnered with them to say, hey, that's not something we practice at Children's. That's not something we wanna do. We wanna be here for you as well. So those are the kind of community partners you have to have. But if you don't have those, it leads to inequity. The last one is be remarkable, but what if we were going to be remarkable for just the cancer patients and not the sickle cell patients? All those patients who may experience seeing things um, from a different lens because the majority of those patients could be white and possibly are white and the cancer patients, but our sickle cell patients don't get the quality of service and the, the remarkable nature of our what we can do. So those are some of the things that we are dealing with and trying to address at Children's. Those are the systemic racism foundations of pieces. I want to say this out loud too. It's not just bias. People can be biased and you can lean upon, well, it's implicit bias, implicit bias. At some point, 
bias turns into actions. At some point, actions turn into outcomes. At some point, outcomes are disparate. And therefore, it's more than just a bias. It's a systemic issue and it leads to racism. Uh, every family essential partner, just real quick here, we want to be every family's essential part, as I talked about in that vision. But what if I was only talking about those that had private insurance and lived in the suburbs? We have about 12 clinics outside of our two main hospitals in St. Paul and, and uh, Minneapolis. And some of those clinics are in Minnetonka, in Edina, and in afflu affluent neighborhoods. But what if we ignore the social determinants of health, like economics, employment, transportation, and just said we're going to serve that population? We'd be fulfilling that promise on uh, addressing in a positive way uh, or negative way for some, uh, enforcing white privilege rather than trying to address it. Now, of course, you know that all of those things I just mentioned, we don't do intentionally at Children's, but all those things we mentioned have happened at Children's and we need to address them. What I say to you is wherever you go work, or wherever you're working now, have that same honest discussion and then make sure you can address that. The last piece here, I wanna talk to you about the impact of racism on kids. And I'm not gonna give you any answers today. I'm gonna to ask you to ask yourself the right questions and then you can ask me some more questions later. Um, Philando Castile, um, I know his mom, I know his uncle, I know his family, I know his cousins, because for two and a half years after he was murdered, I worked with them to address the need for changes in policing and community long before George Floyd was murdered. We wanted to change this. Philando worked at a school in St. Paul. Philando worked with kids on a daily basis. I want you to just imagine and think about, I don't have answers for you, but think about how those kids were impacted when they saw their lunch person on TV and he was killed by police with his little daughter and his girlfriend in the car with them. What do you think kids had to say? What do you think kids had to feel? What do you think kids were experiencing? His kids that he worked with at the school at that time. Well, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, Miles Mays. And Miles Mays um, is, uh, a good friend of mine, a young kid, he goes to Morehouse College. Uh, his mom and I are good friends. And we wanted to tell you, or show you, what Miles was feeling around this time that Philando was murdered. He wrote a, um, this great art piece, Hands Up, We Need Justice, Don't Shoot. So he listed a lot of names on here, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, uh, Eric Garner, um, Amadou uh, <clears throat> uh, Diallo, uh, Alton Sterling, a lot of people on here and I won't tell you who they are. You've got to figure that out on your own, but I wanna make sure that you understand our kids, and he was a teenager at the time, are impacted by seeing this, and they have given up on the system because of that. They've distanced themselves from it and say, you know what, I'm just distanced from this because I'm, I'm giving up on anything being fair or outcomes being fair for me. So that's some of the impact these things have. If you don't know who this is, this is Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake was, uh, in I believe Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, when police approached him and he was going back to his car, they felt afraid for their life as he was facing away from them, walking to his car slowly, and they shot him in front of his children who were in the car. So these are his little boys. They were in the car when he was shot. I want you to imagine what impact do you think that has on his boys, seeing their father, their dad. Remember he showed you that dad earlier, dancing with his daughter? Well, he's paralyzed now. He won't be able to dance with his sons anymore. And he, they saw police shoot their dad in the back. So just imagine what the impact that has on those kids uh, and that family. We all know who this is, this is George Floyd, uh, a dad, a father, um, uh, a man of the community, uh, a native of Houston, Texas. Uh, things that got, get lost because we always see his image underneath uh, Officer Chauvin, but we don't see the man that he is uh, and the man that he was uh, as well. Um, the impact of George Floyd, it goes without saying what happened in community, but our kids saw that. Our kids saw this on a regular basis and now they're seeing it in the trial. And more importantly, kids were at the scene when it happened and the young lady who taped the video, Darnella Frazier, was 17 at the time with her nine-year-old cousin there with her as well. So I want you to think about that. And Donella testified recently, I won't go too much into the trial, but she talked about how that could have been her dad, her brother, her cousin, and the impact that has on her as a young person growing up in community as well. Similar to that, uh, there's a lot of Asian hate crimes going on. These are only a few that I picked out from the articles and headlines. Uh, imagine how kids in the Asian community are feeling when they see people who are their elders being attacked. They see people being attacked for no reason. Uh, as a kid, you see your grandmother, your grandfather, 
your uncle's attack, how are you going to feel? You're going to be afraid. How are you going to feel? You're not going to want to come out uh, and be a part of anybody else's system. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to isolate myself because I don't want to be part of a, a hate crime. I want you to think about this because we talk about kids and racism. Sometimes we forget about the actual things that happen in their daily lives. And this is happening right now as we speak. As I said before, I call them concentration camps. Obviously they're not and no disrespect to my Jewish brothers and sisters, but they are places that here that you wouldn't want to have your family members. You wouldn't want to have them behind barbed wire. You wouldn't want to have kids stacked together and not getting educated. I will say that I see some of this is changing with some current policies, but I, these to change quicker and these to change more often as well. But those are the things that these kids are experiencing on a daily basis. And imagine, is this young lady in the middle of this picture thinking about education? Is she thinking about you know, her family? Is she thinking about what she can do differently? Or is she just thinking about the day-to-day -day of trying to just live her life and she can't really be a kid? So those are the impacts of, of racism on kids. Similar for our transgender kids, uh, some of the most heinous legislation is trying to be passed now and has been passed uh, in uh, many states is anti-transgender legislation. And real, in short, uh, what it is, the wave of bills trying to impact trans athletes and saying they don't have a basis for participating in sports that they uh, for their gender identity. Well, last time I checked and I talked to a lot of my friends, there's no transgender kid I know that's being transgender or saying or pretending they're transgender to play sports. That's who they are. That's who they uh, want to be. That's who they bring to the table, their value every day. And they get bullied daily. They get harassed daily. They subjected to violence daily. Um, but we're passing legislation that says it's all about sports and making sports fair. Once again, these are kids. Once again, all these things are impacting and happening to them. Just imagine those things happen on a daily basis repeatedly. Here's some pictures. I won't stay on it long, but there are lots of kids at these marches. There's lots of kids interacting with police. There are lots of kids um, protesting um, our immigration policies. There's lots of kids who are at the forefront of the change we need to have happen. And we want to make sure that these kids are supported, valued, and also to support it because this has an impact on them on a daily basis uh, as they um, lead us to the next generation of hopefully more more civil rights and more and greater impact. The impact of racism, um, quickly through this, and I'll open up to questions. It causes chronic stress. Um, there's a lot of medical research out there. Once again, all these bullet points, none of them are James. I didn't have time today to cite them all. So don't, when you look at them, I was like, hey, he plagiarized. No, he didn't. He copied other people's stuff. He put it here and he's telling you in this video that it's not his stuff. So it has an impact not only on the chronic stress of the body, when women are pregnant, it has an uh, impact on the birth uh, weight of their, their children. It has an impact on the mental development and brain development of the biological system of their children before they're born as well. And a lot of this racism falls on the backs of Black, Latino, Asian, and Native patients and families. And therefore, the kids are negatively impacted as well from that chronic stress. It is a social determinant of health. The World Health Organization has, has called it one. Uh, I think Hennepin County has said it's a um, social determinant of health and a major public health issue. So as the state of Minnesota uh, as well. And those inequalities through economics, political and social conditions uh, prove that out as well. Uh, racism is a socially transmitted disease. It doesn't exist by itself. When people say kids, I don't know where they got that from or how they act that way or why they treat people differently or why they use that word. Well, it's been transmitted to them, taught to them and passed down from generation to generation. Uh, one of the things that disturbs me quite often when people say that, I see pictures of lynchings that from the 50s and 60s and sometimes 40s, and I see little kids in those pictures with their uh, adult family watching a black man who looks like me lynched. Uh, I can imagine that has an impact on that child, and I imagine that child has been socially transmitted this disease of racism because of that. Uh, it's negative self-esteem. It can get to a point where you feel bad about yourself and you internalize those things that people think about you. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it happens a lot amongst kids. Uh, and one of those things, uh, racism and negative self-esteem, that sometimes people think is positive. A lot of people see young black boys, and if you happen to be over 6'5", and say, oh, you play ball, rather than, oh, you're a medical science. Oh, you're an engineer. Oh, you're an academic genius you automatically assume that person is a ball player because of that racism and that bias. 
Uh, this also leads to the rejection of the healthcare system. As I said before, most healthcare systems are founded on systemic uh, racism and systemic bias and also to structural racism. Therefore, when you're a kid and you see your parents treated like that or you're treated like that, when you get to be an adult, do you want to go back to your healthcare system and get treated? Do you want to take a vaccine that's supposedly going to protect you from COVID? Do you trust the system that's treated you this way over the years? Just questions to ask as we talk about fixing this uh, systemic racism. Um, now, this is the last one for me, and this is one I'm going to hold all of you accountable for on this call and other people that you know. It is a public health issue. There are 145 cities, probably more, and counties across the states that have said it's a public health issue about racism. But what are you going to do about it? What happens? It's a public health issue, but if you don't put more than five cents to it or dedicate resources to it or dedicate holding people accountable for outcomes, it doesn't make a difference if it's a public health issue and the public knows that as well. Last point, getting some good trouble. Uh, my friend John Lewis um, always said getting some good trouble. This is your good trouble. What can you do differently? Be present, create a welcoming environment for places that you're in. Be uncomfortable, have some of these uncomfortable conversations I just talked about today build new relationships across gender lines, across racial lines, across sexual orientation lines, learn new things and be intentional. And then the last piece here, and I'll share this slide deck with you um, if you don't have it, is making sure that you know when you create environments in healthcare especially, that we have offices and places, environments that feel welcoming to families. Have images of diverse families on the walls and multicultural books. Have Diverse staff, one of the things that we don't have at Children's is we don't have a diverse staff of nurses and doctors to reflect our patients and families. So therefore I have to and will be partnering with Morehouse School of Medicine, Meharry School of Medicine and other medical schools that are more racially diverse to get more of those professions here. Uh, also to making sure that your quality assurance assessments as far as how you do your outcomes and medical outcomes address race and the impact race has on that as well. And the last piece is owning your biases as well. I am done. I probably went over a little bit too much, but I did leave some time for questions at the end. So if you have any, please let me know. Thank you so much for that really wonderful presentation. I um, It really brought up a lot of really impactful questions for me and um, just a lot to walk away from, but um, I see that there are some questions in the um, in the chat. If that person would like to speak up and ask that question, um, I would love to open the floor for you to ask it. But otherwise, um, I'll wait for an awkward pause and then ask it for you. Um, and we'll start there. And then I think that there will also be some others who would like to ask questions. But I'll I'll start with. Um, it looks like Brooke Cunningham has some questions. And um, so if Brooke, you would like to ask that. Thanks. So, so, you know, with the week of the trial, it's been pretty quiet. I just went through my email to see if the dean of the medical school had sent out something that I had missed, right? Because what happens, I think, around um, particularly uh, things involving state behavior, like the police, at a uh, land grant state university is that we can be quiet, right? And, and we could even be quiet after things happen. And so part of what I was wondering what, was if, if a health system were to be more proactive and less quiet, around police violence, what sorts of things should we be encouraging them to do? And particularly given your experience um, as a state equity officer with Philando Castile, um, I'm just sort of wondering what advice or what would you like to even see children do in this space besides hosting, you know, debriefing talk sessions, which, which are not, are beneficial, but, but don't seem proactive enough to me, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So great question, Brooke, and thank you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, and, and Dr. Cunningham is an example of more advertising needed. She knows about this because I called her today on some other stuff and said, hey, can you come participate? And she did. So 
we got to get the word out there uh, better next time. So real quick, what can we do, Brooke, and what has Children's done as well? There's this thing called the MBCRE. It's the Minnesota Business Coalition for Racial Equity. It came about after George Floyd's murder, and a lot of about 80 companies are a part of it. It could be something or nothing, um, but the something that it has turned into is last year, legislation, police reform legislation was passed for the first time uh, in over 30 years as far as changes. The reason it was passed, these companies and their legislative liaisons or government relations folks leaned in and put pressure on legislators to get something done in changing police reform. These companies that we work for have money. These land grant institutions have a voice and they haven't been using it before to address police reform. And they use it this time to lean in to get those policy changes made. So that's one thing we can continue to do that um, during the NBCRE. Uh, and then also too, like said, it's um, organization that can help collectively lean in to change those policies. That's where it's gonna help. The other piece I'd say, Brooke, is what we did at Children's is we had we were spending almost a million dollars, about $890,000 in off-duty officers at our two main hospitals, St. Paul and Minneapolis. Our employees, our patients and families, our community told us that's unacceptable. Like, why are we spending that much money on officers? You need to do something different. We did four or five listing sessions. Our CEO, myself, and our COO got involved. And we reduced by a quarter million dollars the number of officers that we have. We still have some for security reasons. We have a partnership with our internal security team and, and external officers. But that $250,000, we're taking out to hire community folks to bring into the hospital and learn more about the communities we serve. So it's not a need to call the hospital's security or an outside officer. We're going to be working in community. And hopefully some of those folks get in healthcare as well, healthcare careers. So those are some of the action steps to your point, uh, Dr. Cunningham, that we should do and have done differently. Thank you. All right, I would love to jump in and ask a question, James. Uh, I was just thinking about your connection of Georgetown Law to um, the relatively recent um, issue that with JAMA where they um, released, had that podcast where they claimed that doctors can't, um, I, I think I'm probably paraphrasing a little bit, but do that doctors can't be racist. And um, I'm just curious, based off of your experience, what can we learn from racist incidents in elite academia? And um, what do we do about you know these people that have these massive platforms? And just, you know, I, I'm just really curious as to your thoughts on this situation. Sure. Uh, the, the incident drama by saying doctors can't be racist and there's no such thing as systemic racism, you fire the person, one. Two, you then talk to the leadership and say, listen, if we're talking about changing systemic issues related to race and bias, we have to show through our actions, as Dr. Cunningham asked, that we have to do things differently. And you have to have a more diverse leadership staff. You have to have a more diverse patient facing staff, you have to have more diverse solutions as well, coming from a partnership with the community. I applaud JAMA because I think the, the, the man was fired and I think they put the executive director on leave. That's what you have to do. The days of apologies for me are gone. Like if you apologize for something that you've been thinking for 30 years and you just happen to say it out loud, your actions have shown that you, that's the behavior you basically are uh, appreciate and want to do. So we want to make sure that we change that as well. So I'd say actions are important. Hold people accountable for their actions and then move forward. Thank you. James, can you say the name of that group again, the Minnesota Business Group? Sure, it's the Minnesota Business Coalition for Racial Equity. And we have a website, it's www.mbcre.org. Uh, and we also have a great partnership with um, a group called the Alliance of the Alliances. And that's led by the African-American uh, Leadership Forum. Um, and my good dear friend and, and partner, somebody Jackie knows, Greg Cunningham. So there's a partnership there too with the black community as well doing some great stuff. I uh, wanted to jump in also, this has been just 
like I knew this would be great and this has just been so fabulous and meaningful. Um, at Children's, uh, given the trial and the continuing, um, you know, parallel epidemic of police violence, does Children's have specific mental health resources uh, or, or, or just specific care for um, children who are experiencing vicarious trauma? Like, like you were describing for the kids who Philando Castile worked with or, or any child who sees this and experiences that trauma and, and feels that in their body. Are there resources specifically to address that? So good question. One of the things we're doing in our redesign is we're going to invest more uh, resource and money to inpatient behavioral health for children. Um, so that doesn't address the outpatient needs. So we're not uh, necessarily an outpatient provider in a large way. We intend to partner with community organizations uh, like the Cultural Wellness Center uh, and others around that. But we noticed that there's a need for our inpatient patients to have more behavioral health supports. So we're going to invest um, I don't think I'm authorized to say the amount yet, but quite a bit of money, millions, uh, in our inpatient uh, behavioral health to address that particular need for our patients uh, and their families. So good question. And we're going to continue to increase our partnership with external uh, outpatient behavioral services to address it as well. Because if we don't, uh, those kids I talked about in the impact, it'll just lead to detrimental negative consequences. James, to that point, just curious, do you think the, is it the Lakeville Clinic, the new Lakeville Clinic, does that help address the mental health issue um, from your perspective? I think I was a little, I was surprised that it was, I think in a majority white uh, area, but I wasn't sure what kind of access mm -hmm. it would uh, give to communities of color. So good question. One thing I just want to explain real quick to the audience. We've done some redesign at our hospital system and in transparency, Jackie Cunningham is on our foundation board, just recently elected, but on the board. So we're happy to have her. Um, when we changed the dynamic and closed some of our clinic um, spaces in the city and moved to Lakeville, we thought that we had negative impact on families of color. What we found though is Jackie, um, we've identified uh, opportunities for them to go closer to their homes, which is some kind of in the East Metro. And we've had not a negative impact on their behavioral services for those particular folks. Uh, and, that's, and that's more of a rehab, behavior rehab clinic, um, as opposed to a behavior, uh, internal behavioral uh, clinic we're talking about. It's more of a rehab clinic. But we have had not a negative impact, I believe to date, knock on wood, because of our planning to make sure that our parents of color and patients of color are still satisfied. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Is that awkward silence? Any other questions or? I don't have any well, questions. Well, I think. Oh, um, sorry, go ahead, Lauren. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to thank you for coming, James. I know we're all busy and it's a tough week. So I appreciate you um, showing up for our students today. Thank you, Laura. Yes, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and to echo what Lauren said and just thank you so much to James for this really just fantastic discussion. Um, Kelia has put in some announcements for the next few sessions that we'll be hosting uh, as part of the SOS. Um, series. And um, I just want to end the recording and thank all of you for your time and James for the incredible and the, this this really incredible discussion that we were able to have. Thanks all. Thank have a